Hey there friends, Dave Politis, k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for a video channel. And Huck is in the office with us. She's being a good girl. And she's saying that Dad, you've been working too hard lately. She goes she needed more time away from the office. More paid time leave, you know how it goes. Yeah, those neck rubs are so good. Yeah, you're a good girl. Okay, so Huck's made an appearance. Time for me to start talking about missing people. You wanna leave, Huck? Okay, you said your hellos. Now, missing people. As we get into the spring months, we're gonna to have to start talking about more hiking protocol, safety issues, etc. And the pros and cons of hiking with dogs. I'm sure that many of you here remember me talking about hundreds of cases where kids have disappeared with dogs. For some reason, parents tend to think that, oh, well, if the child's with a dog, then it must be good. Not necessarily the case. Many times dogs wander, kids wander, and something else happens. Just the way of the world. The, uh, the stories we have today, pretty varied. In fact, the first story I got, we researched this thing for a good solid week and a half to make sure it was true because nobody would believe it. No, nobody would believe it. And in fact, at the time, the people in the communities didn't believe it. So, how much of a difference is there between children? I mean, you take one two-and-a-half-year-old in one community, and you put them up against a two-and-a-half-year-old in another community, are all two-and-a-half-year-olds the same? Can some travel phenomenal distances and some won't travel anything? Well, according to the SAR manual, the disparities aren't that much. And they don't put a maximum distance in those SAR manuals that kids can travel. And in fact, they don't even make a recommendation on the maximum distance. And that's before I started to get into the search and rescue area and talk about this. Because the cases that I present are hard to believe but more importantly, they don't fit within search and rescue protocol, and that's an issue to me. So the first case, like I said, I didn't believe it when I heard it, but I believe it now. Manitoba, Canada. I've been there a couple times. In fact, the upper northern regions are as wild as any place you can imagine. And this is pretty far north place is called Big Eddie, E-D-D-Y. Involves a boy named George McLeod, nine years old. He went missing September 18th, 1923 in Big Eddie. He was a First Nations student and he was studying in Big Eddie and staying at a boarding school called the McKay Boarding School. It was kind of a a big deal back then to be accepted into one of these schools and for a First Nations boy to get in it meant a lot. Now Big Eddie is about six miles southwest of a place called The Pass very near the far western Manitoba border in an area with tons of water lots of mosquitoes very humid, <laughs> tough existence in a September disappearance. Now, when George disappeared, they first searched all of his classes, his residence, the surrounding area, the play field. And this was all very odd because George was a good student. He never ran away before. And he was only nine years old. So 
The community got together, the school actually shut down for a couple days and there was a massive search. They went into the bush, they went into the waters, they talked to the other students. In the end, after three or four days, they decided that George had to have died because there's no way he could survive in the bush this long. They weren't finding anybody in that surrounding two miles that they were searching, which pretty normal for that, two, three miles. And they eventually called off the search. They called his relatives, notified them, just write it off as another boy who disappeared in the bush in Canada. And we have several. But that wasn't the end of the story. So he disappeared on September 18th, October 5th. South of a place called, I'm sorry, north of a place, I'll get this right, south east of a location in Sturgeon Bay, Manitoba. Let's get this right. Here's Big Eddie. Here's Sturgeon Bay. Here's the far western Manitoba border. Here's a place called Phantom Beach, Flin Flon, Deer Lake, Norquay, Sturgis. I'm trying to give you some names that you may be familiar with. But one thing you can all see is there's water everywhere in this area. And in fact, where he disappeared, just to the east, is Clearwater Lake Provincial Park for Manitoba. George disappeared in an area with a lot of moose. Why is that important? Moose are some of the most dangerous creatures in the woods. Yes, they are. And Moose kill a lot of people. People don't think of moose as, as a dangerous breed of animal, but no. They jump up and they paw you and try to knock you down with their front feet. And they weigh way over a thousand pounds a lot of times, and they have great force. And the males have huge racks. So disappearing in an area like where George was, very dangerous. Well, October 5th, 17 days after George disappears, there's two trappers working that area just southeast of Sturgeon Bay. They're deep in the woods, muck, just a watery existence there. And as they're working, they hear something coming, like, like a Somebody's coming in the woods at them. I think that's weird. They turn around and they see a small boy. Not dressed very heavily. Carrying what looked like a homemade bow and an arrow. He just looks at them. And they said, well, hi, how are you? And he says, oh, I'm good. And they carry on a conversation. And the men knew that they were so far back, this boy had to be lost. There's no way he could, he could live anywhere near where they were. So the men ask him, well, where are you from? And he says, oh, Big Eddie. Well, they knew that Big Eddie was a good 100 miles walking distance from where they were. And they just kind of giggled at each other and said, okay, so what's your family name? Because they're thinking he's from around where they're at right now. Sturgeon Bay or uh, uh, Sturgeon Landing. And he says, oh, my name is McLeod. Well, those, those trappers knew everybody in the area and they didn't know anybody by that name. And they said, well, we'd like to take you to town and get you some good food and cleaned up. And he says, okay. Boy, seemed very very at ease, very sure of himself. So besides what they saw was the bow and the arrow, and he had some very knotted, balled up fishing line with a hook. So they take him in and they take him to the RCMP office. 
and the RCMP says, so hi, what's your name? Well, George McLeod. Well, what do you have with you? And he puts down the bow and arrow and the fishing line. And he also had a small knife. And he also had some matches with him. And the RCMP man said, so what do you do with the line? And he goes, oh, I've caught a bunch of fish the last few days. I've eaten those. RCMP is thinking, yeah, right. And he said, well, what do you do with the bow and arrow? And he goes, well, I've, I've shot some birds and some rabbits. And there's the men in the room are just sitting there looking like, is this boy for real? So he explained to him that over that trip of 17 days, when he got hungry, he'd shoot a rabbit or a bird or he'd catch a fish. And there was water everywhere to drink and he would drink the water. So nobody in the room still truly believed him. So one of the trappers that was still there knew many of the, the things you would always remember if you made that trip on foot between Big Eddie and Sturgeon Landing. And so he said, well, as you're walking out of Sturgeon Landing, he asked him for these, you know, what's the biggest thing you saw? And he named this location and the trapper said, yeah, that's true. And he said, well, as you were approaching Sturgeon Landing, you know, did you have to cross this or that? And the boy explained it and he goes, yeah, that's true. After another 10 or 15 minutes, he had everybody in the room convinced that he traveled that hundred miles by himself. <laughs> I've never heard a story like this. <laughs> never. So he had to cross water, bogs, swamps. There were bears up there, moose, snakes. I mean, everything you can imagine. And he made it. I have no explanation for it. In the end, the RCMP and the trappers believed him and they took him back to Big Eddie, to his school. Now the search and, manual, uh, search and rescue manual say that 95% of the time, a nine-year-old will be found in 11.3 miles or less in a mountain setting and on a flat setting, eight miles or less. Obviously blew those numbers right out of the water. One thing about the story that was a little unclear was I don't think anybody believed that George was headed for Sturgeon Landing. Everyone kind of believed he just probably wanted to go out for a night or two and camp by himself. And he did <laughs> for 17 days. Yeah, you can almost make a movie out of that. It's, it's an unbelievable story and true. So, the next time you start thinking about kids and their ability in the wilds, that's probably one in 10 million. And I think it probably helped that he was a First Nations child because he probably heard and learned a lot of the things about living in the bush. Somebody that lived in the city may have never heard. Next case. Another stunner. Boy's name was Eugene Thurlow, two and a half years old, went missing January 12th, 1942, in Palm Springs, California. You can write this down if you want, get a pencil, paper. His address was 1980 Cardillo, C A R D I L L Road in Palm Springs. According to Google Earth, it's still there. At the time, he lived at the far northwest part of the city. Now it's been built up all around there. And uh, it doesn't look like it did back in 1942. But on Monday morning, January 12th, at about 8.30 in the morning, Mrs. Thurlow, put Eugene out in the yard playing with his little Scotty dog named Puppy. Mr. Thurlow 
was a fairly famous local attorney and he had just left for the office. Well, as every good mom does, about 30 minutes later, Mrs. Thurlow goes out to the yard, checks on little Eugene, and she notices that he and the puppy are gone. Now, it was a pretty cold day. He was wearing some long pants, shoes, and a sweater. Nothing was left behind. She searches the yard. She searches the house really well. She goes out to the front. Nobody's there. Looks up and down the street. Nothing's there gets a hold of a next door neighbor and tells her, hey, would you help me search for my little boy? They start searching the neighborhood. Eventually more neighbors get involved. So after searching for two hours up and down the neighborhood, at 11 o'clock, a call was made to the local police and to Mr. Thurlow. He responded along with the police officers. First police officer on the scene searched the house as he should have, searched the backyard as he should have. A call was made for more police officers and the neighborhood was summoned together to help with the search. And they got out right away. One of the first things that was found by searchers was the coat that Eugene was wearing right on the outskirts of the city at a racket club was laying on the ground. Well, that was found at about a one o'clock. Chief knew that schools got out at about two, so he contacted the local school, local high school, local Girl Scout leader, and he had all of them respond when school got out to the local command post, and they were gonna help with the search. And when I read this, it didn't sound like a request. It sounded like, oh no, you're gonna respond. And then it was at this point that the chief requested that the fire department empty their firehouses and respond out to the command post for a search and rescue assignment. The direction that Eugene was walking when he hit this racket club would put him going out into the flat desert. Now what they had going for him, kind of, was January in Palm Springs can be cool and it could get really cold at night depending on the day. And I would say that's probably better than 100 or 110 degree heat in the middle of summer. But still, a boy two and a half years old, you got to worry about hypothermia. So the chief made that call, and at 3 o'clock, he had a bunch of searchers on scene, and he started to organize. And they put all of their resources into the desert setting that would have been just west of the city of Palm Springs on the northwest side. And this was going into an area called Chino Canyon. For people who are from California or know Palm Springs, they know Chino Canyon. Chino Canyon is absolutely epically gorgeous. There is a giant tram that was put in there last couple decades, and it takes you on a trip from the valley floor up to the top of this mountain and then over the top. And the last time I was there was in the middle of summer. And we left the valley, I was wearing, I can remember this, I was wearing shorts, tank top, and before we got on the tram, the man said, do you have a coat? I said, yeah, go, go get it. I said, okay. So we all left, went to the car, came back with coats, I remember it's like 100 degrees and we get up to the top of the tram and there's snow up there <laughs> and it's about 40 degrees it was such a change it was unbelievable it actually felt really good and uh not only do you go from 100 percent desert on that floor but you go up to pine trees and it's just like a totally different world and as you're on this tram you were so high up and it would scare anybody. Uh, I've been on a ton of trams skiing, but that one is a little different. But I encourage you to go. It's, it's something if you've never been to Palm Springs and you're going to go there to visit, take the tram. Well worth it. 
So the searchers are slowly moving in mass towards Chino Canyon. And some of the searchers on the northern side were making more progress than the searchers on the southern side. So the, southern, the northern side made their way up the canyon a small distance, and they thought when they entered the canyon, they actually saw tracks, but they weren't sure. But they thought they did, so they went in a short distance. At about that time, Mr. Thurlow was with the police chief and a few other officers, and they're making their way towards the front of the canyon. And they stop. The police chief is looking through his binoculars. He says, boy, I, I swear I see something on top of the giant boulders in that boulder field right at the beginning of the canyon. So they all look, and it looks like somebody's crawling over the boulders, and maybe a child or something. So they all move in mass that direction. They get to the front where there's giant boulders, I'm talking huge boulders all over the side of this mountain, all clustered together. And they walk around this one giant boulder. There's Eugene. And there's Puppy. They called in the rest of the searchers. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. <laughs> he was in good shape. It was about five o'clock. And the puppy and Eugene seemed like they haven't even done anything. It's like they were all fresh and ready to go. It was weird. Now, the trip they made was nine miles for a two and a half year old. Yeah, but wait a minute. From nine to five, the time they were missing, it's eight hours. And he traveled nine miles in eight hours. That's hoofing it for a two and a half year old. I'm sorry. Now on January 13th, the next morning, Eugene, dad, mom, Eugene wakes up at 5 a.m. <laughs> and wants to play with his puppy and toys. And his parents said, it's like nothing happened. It's like he wasn't exhausted. Parents were absolutely exhausted, completely debilitated. And Eugene was just normal. Bizarre. A child, one to three years, search and rescue manual, says on flat ground, which this was, he'd be found two miles or less 95% of the time. They said on an ultra dry climate, which this would be during the summer, but I wouldn't call it that in the winter, 5.6 miles or less 95% of the time. Now there's no maximums, like I said. So Eugene's found nine miles away. I call that a healthy hike, if he did it. Now they didn't track him all the way. They were just using the points from where his house was to the racket club, boom, boom. And then in the canyon, they did find some tracks. So this is his home right here in North Palm Springs. And at the time, and it's still pretty much on the northwest side of the city. But out in this area, he hit the front of Chino Canyon. They saw some tracks in that matched a small boy. But then nobody saw him go in there. But the sheriff was out here with the dad looking through binoculars and saw what they thought was him crawling around on big boulders. And that's when they went in and got him. Palm Springs. Now, why do I tell you that? Because I, I'm hoping, praying, that NASAR, National Association of Search and Rescue, the largest organization of search and rescue in the world, wakes up and acknowledges some of these things I'm saying. They seem to listen to one person who writes their search and rescue manuals, but never talks about these extreme distances. Now again, in missing 411, 
In that movie, we have one incident where a two-year-old boy went over two mountain ranges and nine miles and was found face down in snow and he lived. We ended up interviewing that person later in life. And also interviewing his mom, who saved the clothes he wore the day he disappeared. It, it was one of the most un surreal experiences of my life to find that. That was in Missing 411. That was a movie that was directed by Ben. Now, why do we tell those? Well, in that first movie, we used Survivor Man, Les Stroud, who makes a living surviving in the deep woods on nothing. And when Les first heard about my work, he did his own vetting of it and he found out I was telling the truth. And he said, Dave, hey, whatever I can do to help you, I want to do it. You're doing good stuff. So when we made the movie, I called Les and he said, I'm in. I want to do it. And so we had Les try to replicate the route that this boy did. And in his words, there's no way we're going to do this. We started off, he started off like at nine o'clock at night film crew following him through the woods, trying to take the path that this boy had to have taken to get there. Stopped him halfway and he used to say, we can't go any further. Without a flashlight, without anything, we're gonna walk off a cliff, walk off a mountain. Someone's gonna get seriously hurt or killed. We, we gotta stop. And it was a good barometer on these cases. Because if Les, who's so used to walking through the woods, deep, deep woods, didn't feel comfortable doing it, then how could a two and a half year old boy make that same trip at dark? And what I've learned since then, and I've told you guys about this, small kids, kids under five, six, 95% of them don't move at night. Why? Because that's their training. It's nighttime you go to bed. <laughs> and a good percentage of them, a per good percentage of them are afraid of the dark. <laughs> okay. So what do you do? Get under a bush, get next to a log, cuddle up, get your fetal position, go to sleep. That's what they do. That's why when you hear these stories about kids moving through the night real young, nah. And in fact, in looking at the Eugene Thurlow case, he wasn't going to be moving many more hours before he was going to lay down and go to sleep. Because when they found him at 5 o'clock, it was already getting dark in Palm Springs, which is just a fact of life in the middle of winter. So I know many of you don't like hearing stories about kids because there's always a sad ending. Well, there's two stories about kids traveling phenomenal distances. Both of them lived, and they lived to talk about it. And I appreciate you being here, like you just don't know. And remember, the kindness revolution costs us nothing to do good things for good people and bad people. It doesn't matter. We're all people trying to get by here on this earth no need to pass judgment on some. Maybe they had just bad luck. We can help them. So, as we approach spring, get out that backpack, take a damp cloth, get the dust off it, and in the coming sessions, we'll be going through it again and talking about trail protocol. In the meantime, be safe, love your family, politeness out.